Good evening and welcome to the 201st edition of The Inventors. Tonight, you'll meet a husband and wife team whose invention raises the question, why might Gundawindi have to change its name? And from New South Wales, a farmer and son have invented a device that they've called a double Dutchman. Does that make you curious? Right. Well, stay with us and you'll also meet a tractor from South Australia that pours concrete. And from New South Wales, a heart rate monitor invented by a young Sydney man who describes himself as an erratic jogger. But now, let's greet our panel. First, a man who has recently gone through the painful experience of becoming a father-in-law, Ross Quinlivan. Good evening, family. <laughs> Next to him, the mother of inventions, Diana Fisher. Good evening. <laughs> and lastly, Professor Neville Quarry. Good evening. As usual, at the end of tonight's show, they will select our inventor of the week, who will receive a cheque for $1,000 from Travel Strength, the Commonwealth Bank's travel service. And I'm happy to say that all inventions, or all inventors that should be appearing on tonight's programme, will be eligible for the big one, the Commonwealth Bank's Inventor of the Year award of $25,000. The lucky inventor of the year will also receive a beautiful trophy from Costa Boda Glass, which, as I speak, is being created by Costa Boda's master craftsman in Sweden. Now, our first invention tonight. It comes from Gundawindi, and according to the source that we checked, the name Gundawindi is Aboriginal and means water running over stones. Now, if the invention you're about to see is as efficient as it appears, there may not be any stones for the water to run over. To clear this land for cultivation required men and machinery. Once the trees were cut down, the stumps, sticks and stones had to be removed. Now, this machine can't cut down trees, but it can pick up sticks, stones, remove stumps and cultivate the soil. The stick and stone picker does all this with one man operating. Drawn by a tractor, the picker measures 2.5 metres wide and 3.5 metres high and 12 metres long. Its weight is 10 tonnes. Drive is supplied from the tractor to the picker via a coupling drive shaft. With the picker stationary, the cutting edge at the bottom of the picture, when lowered into the ground, picks up the debris and passes it onto the three sets of rotors. With the picker's cutting edge now in the ground and the rotors turning, the debris is thrown up onto the steel conveyor belt. The conveyor moves the debris upwards to be finally dumped in a bin. The bin has a capacity of eight cubic meters and is hydraulically operated to allow ease of emptying. The stick and stone picker leaves behind a trail of freshly turned soil in readiness for a crop to be planted. You see what I mean? Please welcome Dennis and Margaret Gore. Well, this is the, the model of the thing we've just seen, obviously, and the only angle we didn't take it on on film was underneath, so that gives a pretty clear view of everything. That, that's the blade there, obviously. The Dennis? Cutting edge here. Yep. And we've got three rotors. We've got a mesh conveyor. Yes. And, and the collection box at the end. Collection box. Which empties. Right. What's your part in this, Margaret? Well, I was going along helping Dennis pick up the sticks and stones. You mean before this? Before this yes. came on, yes. Pretty back-breaking work. Yes, very much so. Yeah. So you um, bullied him into making something to save your back? That's right. Yes. And you are, you are engineering trained, I guess? Not trained. But, but you, you um, have knowledge? Yes. Great. Neville, what do you think of this? Well, I think it's a marvellous thing. You know, I don't believe that you're not trained. You certainly have plenty of knowledge. Uh, it digs in, it cultivates, it in effect rakes, sieves, and then delivers it into the bin. And I think that's a a pretty complex set of operations. The, uh, the blade itself, now, is that likely to wear out or is it likely to break if you run into a particularly big stump or, say, somebody's left some, a large rock there or even concrete? No, when it hits a, a stump, it either, well, stops the tractor or uh, pulls the stump out. Uh, it will the, stop automatically, will it? Uh, the tractor loses traction. Right. And, uh, as far as wear on it, well, it is replaceable. Uh, it's uh, segments of blade that can be replaced. Well, Margaret, you said you were working, sort of picking up the sticks and stones before. Um, is there nothing else like this that will, will do that sort of job? It seems Not strange today. that nobody's invented anything that will quite do this. No, all that's uh, available at the moment um, rakes to rake it into rows, uh, which 
are very ineffective, really. Yeah. How often do you need to do it anyway on open ground? Uh, normally. Yeah. Uh, well, three or four times to get it clean with this yeah. machine. With this machine, it's only once. Yeah. Well, Diana. Absolutely magnificent. I wish I'd had it when I was helping clear somebody's dam. I was doing what you did, Margaret, pick up the twigs and burn them off. It goes into a depth, you say, of 10 inches. Can you set it to a deeper depth, or is that the right required depth, and then you can start cultivating from there? No, it has uh, hydraulic rams on it here, uh, which are controlled from the tractor. Uh, you can, uh, it will come a foot out of the ground, or go <coughs> into the ground 10 to 12 inches, which is infinitely controllable. And the capacity of the bin at the top when it gets all its sticks and stones in it? Eight cubic metres. Well, it's a pretty good lot to handle, isn't it? Ross, mm, what do you think? Margaret, uh, how much can uh, uh, Dennis do in a day? I mean, how much land can he cover with this? Um, well, in very um, stony or sticky conditions, you're about three quarters of an acre an hour up to four acres in well, that's a lot. lighter country. Yeah. And you've taken it on demonstrations because it's obviously the way to sell it is to get it demonstrated. Um, not to this stage. We have had it at uh, Farm Fest in Toowoomba. And what do you want to do, Dennis? Do you want to sell the patent or you want to make it yourself or just work with it yourself? Um, no, we want to have it manufactured under license. Is it expensive? And I wish you well with it. Both of you. Uh, well you may be interested to know that your invention is eligible for the Cooper's Rural Award of $2,500. So good luck with it. <laughs> Jogging has become both popular and fashionable over recent years. As with any form of exercise, care should be taken and a regular plan be adopted. This is particularly important when recovering from illness, and in such cases, to monitor your heart rate while jogging is most desirable. This jogger is wearing a heart rate monitor. She carries a digital readout pulser on which her heart rate is displayed. Being able to see her heart rate at any time, there is no chance of exceeding her limit. An elastic belt worn around the chest holds three sensors. These three sensors are cabled to the digital readout pulser, which can be held in the hand or worn on a belt. The heart rate monitor has a heartbeat range of 30 to 300 beats per minute. Inventor Rod Savage claims it has an accuracy of plus or minus 2%. Ladies and gentlemen, please greet Rod Savage. Well, Thank you. Now, you're wearing the belt at the moment, and so we can tell that your heartbeat is 130, 131, 133. What, what should it be? It's normally about 75. <laughs> you're a little on edge, are you? So, now, that's, that's the result. Are, are you wearing the belt at the moment? Yes, I am. Could you expose yourself a little? <laughs> this is a family show. <laughs> I see. There it is. Right. And the sensors are inside on your skin, obviously. Which one? And the idea is to get as near to the heart as possible. That's the idea. Right. Are, you a, are you a medical man? Serviceman for medical electronics. I see. Mm. So you're an instrument maker, in effect. Type. Serviceman. Yeah. yeah. Right. What do you fancy about that, Diana? All of him. I thought you might. <laughs> I'm glad he's still alive. I mean, he's tick, tick, ticking as we go along. Rod, good evening. Uh, did you invent this uh, heart pulser purely for medical reasons for people who may have had heart problems or for those idiot large fat gentlemen who go out after a rather large lun lunch and are too fat and a bit of check their Watch heart it. to see if Watch they're it. still Watch going? <laughs> I mean, what did you invent it for? Who? Uh, myself mainly. When I started jogging, I was a little worried I was overdoing it. Yes. And uh, I've always worked in the medical field and uh, it's very useful to know your heart rate. Are, are there more than three uses? I've merely said for athletes and people who need to study mm -hmm. their heart count. Medical reasons, obviously for people who have had heart complaints. Is there any other reason that you would need or should have it? Athletes are uh, finding it very useful for uh, calculating their fitness uh, and gaining maximum benefit out of their training. Yes. And the three sensors that are against you, they're stainless steel and uh, there's no electrical appliances whatsoever, so it's absolutely safe. Yes. 
and even if it yeah, gets hot yeah. and sweaty or running in the rain, nothing can go wrong. You can't get a shock. No, it's no like you, Diamond, it's shockproof. Right. <laughs> Ross? Yeah, Rod, do you have to wear electro gel on the sensors? Uh, no. no. No, not at all. And I know the doctors have trouble with men with hairy chests. I mean, <laughs> is there any trouble with this with sensing through your hair? Yes, there would be if you had hair in that region. It's generally below the, the hairier area. And the women, <laughs> area. And the women find it as comfortable as you do? Yes, no, no trouble at all. In their own different way. <laughs> yes. But you'd have, to, you'd have to do this with the supervision of a doctor, wouldn't you? You'd, you couldn't just go off there and try to beat yourself all the time, would you? I think it'd be advisable, but most people uh, wouldn't have any problem. And what do you see the unit costing? I've estimated around 145 in uh, small-scale oh, production. you like a novel? Yeah, I do. I, I would like to see it added to, um, you know, as an attachment to a digital watch, as an extra function there, so instead of the, the time or the alarm coming up, you're, you're pulsed But the, there's, <laughs> there's one thing that worries me about this sort of thing, and is that um, people tend to regard any recorder and any score as something to, to beat. You know, and you, you come puffing in and say, oh, I made 200 today. And you <laughs> collapse and die on the spot. Yeah. So I think it's very important what Ross had brought up, I think, that everybody should have themselves checked by a doctor yeah. to see exactly what their, pace, uh, their pulse rate mm -hmm. normally is so they don't exceed it because it's not really the same for everybody. It all is with age right. and, and weight and many things. Would, would a doctor, if I may interrupt, would a doctor mm -hmm. tell you what is not what your normal one is but to what extent you should safely go? Definitely. I guess he would, and you stick to yes. that. After a fairly simple stress okay. test, the doctor would tell you. By implication, then, does it mean that jogging can be dangerous unless you have knowledge that this provides? Oh, no. no. Right. Okay. <laughs> You'll be delighted to know that your invention is eligible for the MSA Safety and Community Welfare Award of 2,500. <laughs> Apart from winning the $25,000 from the Commonwealth Bank and the trophy I've already mentioned, our 1980 Inventor of the Year will also win a trip to Geneva to display his invention at the ninth Annual Exhibition of Inventions and New Techniques, compliments of the Apex Clubs of Australia. You may remember a few weeks ago, Diana previewed some of the delights awaiting our Inventor of the Year in Geneva. Well, while she was there, she talked about the coming exhibition with the president of the organising body, Monsieur Jean-Luc Vincent. Bonjour, Monsieur Vincent. Bonjour, Diana. Uh, bienvenue à ABC Television d'Australie. Et je suis très contente d'avoir fait votre connaissance. Moi aussi, je suis très heureux de vous accueillir à Genève, et en particulier en été, oui. puisque depuis cinq ans, <laughs> vous venez avec la télévision australienne, ABC, au Palais des Expositions, pendant l'exposition. Le plus important au monde, pourquoi deux raisons. Première raison, nous sommes la seule exposition qui est autonome. Oui. Toutes les autres expositions d'invention oui. font toujours partie d'autres expositions d'un genre différent. Oui. Donc nous sommes la seule exposition qui, qui présente que des inventions. Oui. La deuxième raison, nous avons chaque année 545 exposants oui. de 28 pays qui présente plus de 1000 inventions. Oui. Si vous prenez toutes les expositions oui. dans le monde, oui. ils ont moins d'exposants que nous, nous avons à Genève. Oui. Combien dix jours Dix jours. Oh. Et dix jours, vous savez, ça paraît long, mais en réalité, c'est court. Oui. Parce que nous avons près de 100 000 visiteurs. Oh. Et dans ces visiteurs, le 80% sont des visiteurs professionnels. Oh, oui. Et ces visiteurs qui viennent du monde entier restent souvent trois jours, quatre jours, même plus, pour signer des contrats, pour parler avec les exposants et faire de bonnes affaires. Oui. Maintenant, nous sommes dans le centre de ville et près de le palais des expositions. Oui. Et pourquoi euh, là, d'ici Bien écoutez, vous, vous l'entendez, nous sommes bien dans le centre de la ville puisque vous entendez les voitures oui. qui vont d'ailleurs nous déranger. Mais il faut savoir que c'est la route où il y a le plus de voitures en Suisse. Oui. Donc le Palais des Expositions est dans le centre de Genève et placé sur une voie importante de circulation. Oui. Quel avantage pour les inventages pour les inventeurs Bien, Écoutez, l'avantage pour les inventeurs, il y en a trois. Oui. Le but du salon pour les inventeurs, c'est soit de trouver 
des fabricants, oui. de trouver des financiers ou des agents de vente qui vont commercialiser leur invention. Oui. Nous avons des pays, nous avons l'Australie, bien oui, sûr, bon, bon. <rire> nous avons tous les pays d'Europe, oui. nous avons des inventions qui viennent d'Amérique du Sud et des États-Unis, et également cette année, pour la première fois, l'Union soviétique. Oui. Et parmi les 1000 inventions que nous avons chaque année, plus de 350 sont vendues sous forme de licence qui représente un chiffre d'affaires de 25 millions de francs suisses. Oui, Monsieur le Président, êtes-vous un inventeur Écoutez, je n'ai pas fait d'invention, de, 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 à l'exception de l'exposition que j'ai bien sûr inventée. Ah, ah bon, c'est très bien. All that and Geneva too. Now, if winning $25,000 and a trip to Geneva appeals to you, it's still not too late for you to let us know. So, all you've got to do is pick up an application form from the nearest branch of your Commonwealth Bank and send it to us at this address. The Inventors, ABC TV, GPO Box 487, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Now, wine and feature films are not the only fields in which South Australia excels. They've also provided us with some wonderful inventions. Look at this. The problem of pouring concrete water tanks at heights above two meters prompted inventor Noel Isaacson to produce this hydraulic concrete mixer. Mounted on front-end loader arms, the mixer uses the tractor's hydraulic power to drive a hydraulic motor via chain and sprockets, which turns the mixing drum. The front-end loader controls are used for height control and tilting the mixing drum. The pouring height is illustrated here in a transfer between mixing drum and a front-end loader scoop. Being able to pour directly from the mixer to the area where the concrete is needed saves double handling. Please welcome farmer, grazier, Noel Isaacson. <laughs> no, that's quite a remarkable piece of equipment. What inspired this invention? Well, probably laziness. I mm -hmm. hate two operations where you can do it with one. Well, at least two, probably three in that case, wouldn't you? Three, mean? quite often. If yeah. you using, could use a barrow in a lot of applications, you don't need it there. What were you doing that, that inspired this? Or that brought up your laziness? <laughs> well, well, we pour a few concrete tanks on our own properties mm -hmm. and uh, shed floors and that sort of thing and uh, this is the easy way to do it. It saves bringing one of those great big ready, ready mix mm -hmm. well, trucks, yes. Uh, Neville. Well, no, there, there are other things that work mechanically and which attach to the, to the rear of the tractor. What I think is particularly good about this one is that it's hydraulic, first of all, and that it is in front and that you can lift it at various heights. So you've got this uh, an ideal combination of mobility. You can move the thing around, you can tilt it up and down, and it rotates the whole time. So um, you know, this, this ability to move from place to place quickly without it setting in the, in the uh, front end loader or anything like that, I think that's a really good device. Um, Ross, what do you think about marketing? I think it's good. I think uh, the thing about this, Noel, I understand, is that you can use it not just for concrete, but you can mix grain or carry water so that on a property, if a property owner had it, he could find a lot of work for it. Is that true? That's true. We've, we've ha uh, had one operating for about 12 months and we're still finding jobs that we do with it. Mm -hmm. and, and the way it is, I understand, is that it's very simple to put on the front loader, that uh, once the man owned it, he can uh, maintain it and using it. It's very easy, a very easy system. Is that yes, there? it's only three pins to put in and plug in the hydraulics. Mm -hmm. And what would you like to do? Would you like to get into the business of making them? or? No, we'd like to get someone to make them for us. It's very good. What do you think, Diana? Do you like it? I want to know how much it costs before I get in there buying one or two. Because we haven't got as far as getting someone to make them, it's pretty hard to come to a definite cost, but probably about $800. Uh -huh. Now, what exactly is your invention? Is it the system that is in front of you on the hydraulic arm with the rotating uh, barrel on the top making the cement? Is, is all of that your invention? The Which bit's your invention? Well, it's all my invention, but the bit that is uh, patented is the method of attaching it to a front-end loader and 
Tipping right, it. I just thought somebody might pinch it because it uh. looks so easy. I hope you've got it patented. The thing that I liked is that it's all in front of you. You can see what's happening. And by that method, it means that you can get it right down to the ground mm. uh, when you're loading it. So mm. you can just shovel one lot in, whatever it is, whether you've got pig uh, food, as you said, mixing grain mm. or mm, a pig swill or whatever you've got, or whether you have got concrete. And you can mm. save time, effort and energy by taking it up to even perhaps the first floor of a house. Mm. You said you build uh, tanks. Mm. Also, I guess on a share farming basis, it would be an extremely good way of using it. Mm. Is it would that be the way you're thinking of using it? No, it's, a, it's because it'll be so cheap, it's the sort of thing that anyone who's got a front-end loader... Uh, could have. have. Could have. It's mm. What about if a farmer had it? I mean, he'd get enough work out of it, wouldn't he? There'd be absolutely no trouble about making it pay for itself. No, we seem to find plenty of use for it, and we're just farmers. Mm. And I mean, builders on smaller an jobs. enormous amount Sorry. of stuff for a, a damper for the annual Shearer's Christmas party. <laughs> 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 well, you're filling silos, too. I mean, you could easily yeah. shovel up and down, up and down, up and down. It's two, two, th two things arise in my mind. One, um, a small builder, or builders on small jobs could use it. Um, yes. Quite yes. away from the farm. Yes, it would uh, be very handy where it's not worth getting a a ready mix of yeah. you know, for small batches and that sort of thing. And secondly, um, can you detach the cement mix of bowl from it and still use your front loader separately or not? Oh, yes. One, yes. You can, mm -hmm. so it's, you, you haven't locked away one use. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's only a few minutes, probably five and minutes. Find a control swap. with the hydraulic system, I should think, because you can stop it very easily. Mm. Yes. Well, your invention is eligible for the Cooper's Rural Award of $2,500. Thank you. Incidentally, in our grand final, which is only, what now, a few weeks away, in addition to our normal category prizes, we'll also present a Project Australia award of $2,000. Now, as the name implies, this prize will be awarded to the invention which, in the opinion of the judges, does the most to advance Australia. Now, the $64,000 question, what is a double Dutchman? Father and son inventors Bob and Ian Bruinsma have greatly increased the power of a conventional bike with a dual drive system. Power for their bike is delivered by arms as well as legs, putting it way out in front of conventional bikes. On the open road, the bike has little trouble handling hills even when the wind is against you. The dual power bicycle provides excellent exercise as the top part of the body is exercised as well as the legs. The pedalling action by the arms gives power to the front wheel through a front-mounted sprocket and chain. This sprocket chain drives the front wheel in a similar fashion to the normal foot pedal with the crank handle forming the handlebars. With dual drive you can pedal with your feet and hands, your feet alone or your hands alone. There's a hub brake on the front operated by the pedal handlebars. There are also rear wheel brakes operated by a handbrake. For work or just play, the dual-drive bicycle makes a lot of sense. We should like to thank the Northern Suburbs Cycling Club for their help in filming that episode. Now, from Broomshead in New South Wales, Bob and Ian Broomsma. Uh, Bob, which of you, you or Ian, inspired the idea and which of you built it? Well, well it was my thought, uh, but I... I wouldn't have been able to finish it as soon as what we did if my son hadn't helped me to work it out. So that's a good team. Now, you were a cyclist already, I gather, and you found, what, that uh, pushing with your feet was getting a bit hard? Yes, yes, I found myself pushing uphill. Mm. I uh, was pushing my knees down with my hands to make it easier, and all of a sudden the idea came to me, if only we could use our hands as well. Very good idea. Hands the bike. Right. Uh, Ross, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I still think it's a little crazy. Um, <laughs> Ian, um, how about coordination? I mean, it always it strikes me as being a bit like the US president who couldn't chew gum and walk at the same time. I mean, how can you actually do all these things at once? Is it easy? Well, I found it quite easy, yeah. Um, well, if, uh, when we started, I thought it was going to be really hard, and we just, just for the fun of it. But when we made it, it turned out really easy, and so we went on with it. Now, I understand the idea really is that uh, because you work both arms and legs, you get more exercise with arms and legs, and you get more power. Um, but do people laugh at you, Bob, when you ride the bicycle? Yes, they do. They do laugh at you. 
<laughs> but uh, we find ourselves, it becomes like a front wheel drive car, um, especially when you go around the corners, mm. you have more control over your bike. And what would it cost, supposing I did have a bike and I wanted to convert it, uh, what would it cost me to buy, say, a kit to convert? Well, yes, it's a kit, as yeah. you say, and it, the, the, the parts cost us $52. So it's that, that, that gives you fair idea. Right. So it's going to be $90. You pay $90? <laughs> well, I might. I'm like you. I'm still laughing at the sort of funniness of doing it. Um, Ian, is it possible? You see, that bike probably wouldn't fit me because I would have to go right down here with the handlebars. Can I move the handlebars? Can I move the saddle? Could you show me what I'd have to do? Yes. Well, you can easily just undo the nut here. Right. And slide it forward and backward. Right, you and wish. the saddle can go up and down yeah, up like and an down. ordinary yeah, bicycle. Like and if I've got the baby or the shopping, can I yeah, put it on the back? put it in the back here. Yeah, well, I'm practical, you see. I've got to have all of that. But you do get more power out of it. Yeah, oh, yes, a lot more, yeah. It looks yeah. very Heath Robinson to me. What do you think, Professor? I think there's no doubt about the mechanical advantage uh, of being able to use your arms as well, and, and the exercise would be good for your arms in addition. I had a, actually a sneak um, use of this beforehand down the corridors of power of the ABC. I left a number of scars on the walls, <laughs> um, mainly because in getting onto it, I found that um, the handlebars tend to go backwards and, and put on the brake. Mm -hmm. Is that my fault or is it the bike's oh, fault? It is really good. I, you, <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> when you get onto it, you, you really push it forward and push some weight on the handlebars. It just as you get onto it. So, mm. right. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And don't forget, they laughed at whoever it was said the world was round yeah. and at Thomas Edison. So don't don't bother about them laughing because your invention is eligible for the Life Be In It Recreation Award of two thousand five hundred dollars. Thank you. Now, while the panel collects their thoughts on who's going to win the Travel Strength $1,000 cash prize, let's have another look at tonight's inventions. First of all, from Queensland, we saw the Gore family picking up sticks and stones with this device. Then we jogged with Rod Savage's heart rate monitor. That's from New South Wales. We followed that with uh, Noel Isaacson's concrete mixer from South Australia. And finally, from New South Wales again, we met the flying double Dutchman invented by Bob and Ian Bruinsma. Four good inventions. What do you think, Diana? Oh, thank you. Well, I think we've had a great night tonight and all very varied. I thought that uh, Ian and Bob's bicycle was uh, unique and a, a really very good exercise machine, either going along or if you want to put it on blocks in your garden or garage. Noel Isaacson's hydraulic uh, concrete mixer, a superb idea, time, effort and energy all saved. Ron Savage, the heart pulse monitor. Well, for those of you who want to jog, it'll keep you in time with what your heart should be and those that want to keep a check on themselves. But for me... It goes to Margaret and Dennis Gore with their sticks and stones or whatever that lovely title is because that's the one that's going to also do great things for us. Future Thank you, Diana. Food, Neville. Well, the double Dutchman bike, I think that might be better as a flying Dutchman cycling from here to eternity. Um, the heart rate monitor, monitor is something I'd like to strap on someone else to see how they're going rather than me. Hydraulic concrete mixer, I think that's very good. But the sticks and stones picker-upper, I think that's the best one tonight. I'll agree with everybody. Uh, <laughs> for once in my life, I'll say sticks and stones. Well, there it is. It's a clean sweep for Dennis and Margaret Gore of Queensland and their stick and stone picker. Dennis and Margaret, would you come in, please? Dennis and Margaret, here's your cheque for $1,000 from Travel Strength. Congratulations. Please stay with us for a moment while I say good night. From our panel, from Ross Quinlivan, right. Diana Fisher, Neville Quarry, and myself, and our inventors of the week. Good night. We'll see you this time next week on The Inventors.